Hey, this is Robert, and I'm somewhere in retirement. And this video is about my commemorative coin collection with my model trains behind me. I truly enjoy commemoratives, where each coin is different and includes some of the best designed U.S. coins of the 1900s. But first, let me tell you how I got started collecting coins. The first coins that I ever collected were Washington Quarters, straight out of my pocket change, way back in the late 50s and early 60s. That was a time when you could still collect buffalo nickels, mercury dimes, franklin half dollars, and even silver dollars in your pocket change. With a little effort, I completed a set of Washington quarters and felt really good about myself. This was while I was still during my teenage years and collecting was fun and a great hobby. Never saw it as an investment when I was in my teenage years and I never had any really expensive coins at that point in my life. But during the last 60 years of my coin collecting, I've had complete sets of some coins. I've had some very expensive coins and I've gone from collecting only gold coins to only collecting classic silver commemorative coins. My collecting philosophy now is that commemorates are fascinating in many ways and that to know them is to love them. There are 50 coins in this collection. Each one is totally different and 48 of the 50 are half dollars. The one quarter and one silver dollar you will see will be in the very first three coins. All the commemorates were minted from 1892 to 1954, a span of only 62 years. All my coins range in prices from a few hundred dollars to a couple that are valued at 5000 each. And the coins that you're about to see images of are my coins that were professionally photographed. And for safekeeping, I store them in a bank safety deposit box. Each coin is different and unique. Its own story is interesting. And each coin was meant to commemorate some event, place, person, or anniversary. Some of these coins are truly works of art. while others are just rather plain. Some have taken on beautiful toning. And others are very lustrous. You must also remember that each of these coins has a monetary value in our currency. Perhaps someone might have seen one in their pocket change way back in the day when they were many, many years ago. And one explanation in my use of terminology. A numismatist, or coin collector, would call the coin's front side the obverse, and the back side its reverse. I believe that my intended audience will relate better to my own saying front and back to refer to the sides of a coin. As I discuss the features and details of each of the 50 coins, you may at some point want to spend more time on a particular coin. So, when this happens, and it will, I suggest that you hit the pause button and spend some time looking at the coin's features. So I ask you to get comfortable for a few minutes, get a glass of wine or sweet tea, or my wife might even get a glass of sweet tea moonshine. And let me entertain you with a story about each one of my commemorative coins. And lastly, before I start, if you stick around at the end, I'll show you some of my model train collection, some of what you see behind me now. My 50 coins will be presented in the order in which they were minted, 1892 to 1954. Let's get started. The 1893 World's Columbian Exposition Half Dollar. My coins that you're about to see have never been in circulation, and all are stored in slabs like this in my bank safety deposit box. Never to be touched or experienced any more toning. The picture on your screen was professionally taken from the coin that's in my hand right now. This first commemorative coin was minted in 1892 and 1893 in Philadelphia. It was decided that the coin would sell for a dollar each to raise money to help defray the exposition expenses. The exposition was held in Chicago to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Columbus landing in the New World. The head of a male on the front side is intended to represent Christopher Columbus. Since there were no authentic portraits of Columbus in existence, the United States Mint was forced to use an imaginary portrait for his image. The three-masted ship on the back side is intended to represent the Santa Maria, Columbus's flagship. Now, let me talk about toning or the colors on a coin. My coin that you're looking at now is lustrous and naturally toned with different colors showing on both sides. Most collectors look for beautifully natural toning and will pay a premium for it. The more vivid the colors, the more variety of different hues on a coin will increase its value. This can make a seemingly common low-value coin a rare collectible. A rare or scarce coin that has beautiful toning on it can reach astronomical values when sold. 
since beauty is in the eye of the beholder, it's very difficult to predict with certainty the effect toning will have on the final value of a coin. Silver coins tend to tone in the most vivid colors. Colors can range in a variety of hues from brilliant blue to deep magenta, from vivid red to deep orange, and a variety of shades of olive, green, and gold. Some of the following silver coins that you're going to see tone because of the way they were stored for a long period of time. Some sat for 50 to 100 years in canvas bags in the United States Treasury vaults. The chemicals in the cotton that was used to make the canvas bags reacted slowly over time and resulted in some beautifully rainbow-toned coins. Additionally, certain coin folders or albums and paper envelopes that were not made of archival quality material can contain sulfur and acids that will react with a coin surface. This can result in some beautifully rainbow toning, which you will see on a few of my coins. This is the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition Half Dollar. The 1893 Isabella Quarter Dollar. This quarter dollar and the silver dollar that follows are the two exceptions to all in this collection being half dollars. This Isabella Quarter is another example of a great toned coin with beautiful natural color. This 1893 quarter was made specifically for the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. For the front side, Queen Isabella is shown since she furnished the financing for Columbus's voyage, vowing to pledge her crown and jewels if necessary. This quarter became the first legal tender United States coin to depict a foreign monarch, and the first coin to depict a woman other than a portrait of Miss Liberty. On the back side, the Board of Lady Managers, which is right up here, was formed at the insistence of Susan B. Anthony, who was determined that women should be adequately represented in the administration of the exposition. This Board of Lady Managers took complete charge of the quarter dollar project and stated that the coins were to have female motives. The design on the back side shows a woman spinner holding a stick wound with yarn in her left hand, dangling a spindle from her right hand. Both these attributes were intended as symbolic of a woman's major industry at the time of Queen Isabella. That row was of making fabrics for garments, bed liners, and other things. These coins were also sold for a premium, originally a dollar, and later reduced to 50 cents for this quarter to help defray the cost of the exposition. The 1893 Isabella quarter dollar. The 1900 Lafayette silver dollar. This coin was a commemoration of the centennial of George Washington's death. The heads of Washington and Lafayette here together, which is a testimony not only to their joint role in the Revolutionary War, but to their friendship in life. The childish Washington and the then extremely handsome young Lafayette were closer than brothers throughout the war. Any funds raised from the sale of this coin were to be used to erect in Paris in 1900 a statue of General Lafayette on horseback. This was to be a gift for the American people to honor the Frenchman who in 1777, when he was not quite 20 years old, risked his life and fortune by paying French troops to come with him to America. Although he was wounded in the Battle of Brandywine, Lafayette received the designation of Major General and served to the end of the war. In 1824, the French hero of the American Revolution visited the United States once again and was given a grand welcome, he toured all 24 states, and was designated by Congress as the nation's guest. The relationship between America and France has been close ever since that time, as evidenced, among other things, by France's gift to America of the Statue of Liberty, dedicated in 1886. The 1900 Lafayette Silver Dollar. The 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition Half Dollar. Starting here, the rest of my collection will be half dollars. This next commemorative coin created was the 1915 Half Dollar struck in San Francisco in conjunction with the Panama Pacific International Exposition held in that city in 1915 to celebrate the 1914 completion of the Panama Canal and also the rebirth of the Golden Gate City from the 1906 earthquake and fire. On the front side, Miss Liberty is seen scattering flowers with a naked child behind her, holding a large cornucopia to represent the abundant resources of the American West. It must be mentioned that some art historians say that Miss Liberty here had a fat posterior, heavy upper arms, and thus an unpleasantly stiff, dumpy manner. I personally do not agree, as I see a beautiful woman and child. In the background is seen a setting sun with all its rays. On the back side, oak and olive branches flank an eagle. The olive branch is tradition for peace, somewhat ironic since World War I was already underway in 1915. The 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition Half Dollar. The 1918 Illinois Centennial. 
This cone was meant to help celebrate the centennial of Illinois being admitted into the Union. The front side shows a beardless Lincoln, which would have been pre-1860. The relevance of the defined eagle on the back side is impossible to establish. The state motto is right here, State Sovereignty National Union, and that is of Illinois. The eagle turns away from the rising sun towards the west, as did the people who migrated there from the east coast in search of vast tracts of farmland. Note also the olive branch, down here at the bottom. It's prominent. It's meant for peace, but there are no arrows for war. Their presence on a coin designed during the concluding months of World War I might have been considered just a little bit raw. Interesting fact about this half dollar. This is the only silver coin to depict Lincoln, but the Lincoln copper penny has been struck every year since 1909. This is the 1918 Illinois Centennial. The 1920 Maine Centennial. This lustrous gem coin was intended to circulate at face value to help promote Maine. The front side depicts the state arms, which are represented as a moose and behind it a pine tree. Agriculture is represented with a scythe for cutting grass or reaping crops. Commerce is with an anchor. The state crest, which is the blazing star with the motto de Rigo, means I direct or I lead, and it has been a state motto since the state joined the Union in 1820. Note that the moose and the pine tree are defined by sunken outlines. This area right in here is sunken. Also note the symbolism in representing commerce by a seaman with an anchor. Maine's fisheries and lobster trappers were always extremely important in its economy. The moose apparently represents the fur trade and the pine trade represents the trade in, t in timber and forestry products. The scythe suggests that there will be some above ground crops, although Maine is possibly more famous for its potatoes, which must be dug up. The wreath on the back side is not made up of the expected spruce or birch, but of some kind of longleaf pine to go with its pine tree state nickname and the pine tree in the state arms. This is the 1920 Maine Centennial. The 1920 Pilgrim to her Century. In 1920, the 300th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims at Plymouth furnished the opportunity for numerous celebrations throughout New England, including the minting of this coin. The front side of this Pilgrim coin has the portrait of Governor William Bradford, 1590 to 1657, who was said to represent a typical Pilgrim at that time. Bradford was among the pilgrims who came from England aboard the Mayflower, arriving in the New World late in the year 1620. On the coin, Bradford's left arm supports a Bible, representative of the separatist religious movement of which the governor was a member, a group which endeavored to lead their lives in strict accordance with that book's teachings. Alternatively, some believe the book held by Bradford is his own, History of Plymouth Plantation, which told of life in the colony. The backside showed a view of the Mayflower, but with an error in the ship's rigging, for it showed a type of sail that had not been used at that early date. The 1920 Pilgrim to her Century. The 1921 Alabama Centennial. Of the two people portrayed on the front side, the one identified as Bibb is William Bibb, 1780 to 1820, Alabama's first governor from 1816 to 1820. Kilby is Thomas Kilby, the governor of Alabama when the coins were first minted. The fact that Governor Kilby was a living individual raised much public comment, for before this all legal tenant coins had depicted dead individuals. From George Washington onward, enlightened public officials took the stance that living people should not be portrayed on coinage. The 22 stars flanking these portraits refer to Alabama as being the 22nd state to enter the Union. The same message is represented by the numerals and the cryptic 2X2 right here. The X, although commonly misread as times or by, refers to the red St. Andrew's cross found on the Alabama state seal. So that two by two is representative of it being the 22nd state. On the back side, the warlike eagle with shields and arrows, but no olive branch for peace, is that of Alabama state seal, which also yielded the motto, which is right here, here we rest, with no pun intended about the sleepy deep south. This is the 1921 Alabama Centennial. The 1921 Missouri Centennial. Missouri was admitted to the Union on August the 10th, 1821. 
A century later, Congress authorized half-dollar pieces to be struck in commemoration of this event. On the front side is the portrait of Daniel Boone. Now, since there were no known portraits of him in existence, this is an artist's conception of what he might have looked like. On the back side were shown standing figures of Daniel Boone and an Indian set against a story background with Sedalia. Sedalia's ain't the bottom, right, right here. Sedalia was stamped in below, representing the location of the exposition for which the pieces were created. It is most unusual to have the same person depicted on the front and back of the same coin as Daniel Boone is on this one. It has only happened four other times. Also, the notations Liberty, E Pluribus Union, and In God We Trust are not present on this Missouri half dollar, and that is the first instant of the omission of all three mottos on a commemorative half dollar. On the back side, the 24 stars you see in the background relate to Missouri's rank as the 24th state admitted to the Union. This is the 1921 Missouri Centennial. The 1922 Grant Memorial. The dates 1822-1922, right here above half dollar, refer to the centennial of the birth of General, later President, Ulysses Simpson Grant. In the Civil War following his victory at Chattanooga, President Lincoln named him General of the American Armies. It was Grant who accepted Lee's surrender at Appomattox in April 1865. Grant was elected president of the United States on the Republican ticket in 1868 and was re-elected in 1872. He did not serve with much distinction and his two terms were remembered as being full of graft and corruption. Following his presidency, he took a trip around the world. And then in 1884, he lost much of his fortune when a New York City bank failed. Devoting his time to writing his memoirs, Grant finished them just four days before his death. The book earned about $450,000, which was a precursor of what many later presidents would do. Telling about the administration was more lucrative than the office itself. The backside depicts a small frame house at Point Pleasant, Ohio, near Cincinnati, where Grant was born in 1822. This is the 1922 Grant Memorial. The 1923 Monroe Doctrine Centennial. The bust laid with Monroe and Adams represent President James Monroe and his Secretary of State, later also President, John Quincy Adams. Their names are joined by links of chain. Chains right here linking those two names. This represents their agreement on the so-called Monroe Doctrine, which was a doctrine developed by John Quincy Adams and supported by Monroe in his presidential message in 1823. This doctrine stated that European countries that interfered with countries in the Western Hemisphere would meet with disapproval or worse from the American government. Conversely, the United States would not become involved in European politics. What appears on the back side is to represent the continents of North and South America, but it proves on closer examination to depict two female figures. Miss North America is holding some kind of branch right here, too vague to be identified as to the species in her left hand, while her right hand here also twig to her compatriot sister, Miss South America, who holds a cornucopia over here. The scale indicates that these two females have adult proportions. If you can't see these two figures, stop the video for a moment and look again. It is suspected that the reason for showing ocean currents here in the Pacific, ocean currents in the Atlantic, the reason for showing those ocean currents was to represent the unending flow of imports and exports between the two continents. The words Los Angeles, down here at the bottom, referred to where the centennial celebration was to take place. This is the 1924 Monroe Doctrine Centennial. The 1924 Huguenot Walloon. The Huguenot half dollar became embroiled in controversy because it was perceived as religious propaganda. This coin was shown to be a violation of the First Amendment, which mandates separation of church and state. These government-issued coins raised funds for the Council of Churches to celebrate the 300th anniversary of Calvinites settling New Netherlands, which is the present-day New York. Most of the 30 families that made the initial trip in 1624 were Walloons, French-speaking people from the south of Belgium. Huguenots were from France. The government, according to the First Amendment, cannot raise funds for any church group. This was ignored by the government, and the coins were minted. A second dispute centered around its front side design, which features the conjoined bust of Admiral Coligny of France and William the Silent of the Netherlands. Both were Huguenots, but both have been dead for several decades by the time New Netherlands was settled. It is believed that these two figures 
were chosen because they were popular martyrs that perished in a time when Protestant Spalivian and John Calvin were killed. The backside depicts a ship, also called New Netherlands, that carried the colonists to the New World. This is the 1924 Huguenot Walloon. The 1925 California Diamond Jubilee. This coin was issued to celebrate the 75th anniversary of California statehood and has been widely praised for its beauty in the years since. The mint in creating this half dollar used motives invoking California at the time of statehood in 1850. The front side depicts a gold rush era prospector kneeling. He's washing his material with his pan, looking for traces of gold. The back side adapts the flag of California, known as the bear flag, showing a grizzly bear. This bear came under especially strong criticism because its trunk was disproportionately short in relationship to its leg length. But art historians have given this coin high design praise, noting it is one of America's greatest works of coin collecting art. The design is bold and effective. The types are large, simple, even with folds of cloth for the miner's shirt and trousers, felt for his cap and leather for his boots. Muscles, bones, and tufts of fur express the massive determination of the bear. Within the limits of modern machine design in the 1920s, compositions such as these are about as much as you can be expected of a mint die designer. Beautiful coin. The 1925 California Diamond Jubilee. The 1925 Fort Vancouver Centennial. The front side depicts John McLaughlin, who was in charge of Fort Vancouver, which is present-day Vancouver, Washington, which laid across the river from what would become Portland, Oregon. He was a Canadian who gave up his medical practice for the fur trade, becoming in 1821 one of the negotiators of the merger of the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company. He built not only Fort Vancouver, but Oregon City. From there, he effectively ruled the Oregon country on behalf of the Hudson Bay Company. McLaughlin was what government there was in the Oregon country. McLaughlin's word was obeyed by white man and Native American alike, and there were no significant wars during that time. The backside shows a frontiersman dressed in skins, musket at the ready, defending the stockade settlement. In the background is Mount Hood, one of the area's most famous landmarks. After the coins were minted in 1925, they were flown from the San Francisco Mint to Washington State by airplane as a publicity stunt. They sold badly, and much of the issue was returned for redemption and melting. Due to the low number of surviving pieces, these coins are very valuable today. This is the 1925 Fort Vancouver Centennial. The 1925 Lexington Concord Sesquicentennial. The Lexington Concord Half Dollar, or Patriot's Half Dollar, was struck in honor of the 150th anniversary of the Battles of Lexington and Concord, which began the American Revolutionary War. The Battles of Lexington and Concord took place in these neighboring Massachusetts towns on April 19, 1775, the day after Paul Revere's famous ride. Resentment against the British culminated in the shot heard around the world, igniting the spark for American independence. The front side, labeled Concord Miniman, is a close copy of the statue commonly called the Miniman Statue at Concord, Massachusetts. The statue depicts one of the volunteer soldiers ready to take part in the battle which began the Revolutionary War. It depicts a farmer, standing with one hand upon his plow and the other hand grasping a musket, his head alert as if he was waiting for a summons, his body held ready to advance. He was ready to leave his coat and his plow, ready for the battlefront at a minute's notice, musket in hand, presumably awaiting the call to arms from the old belfry, which is the church that sounded the alarm on the fateful day of Paul Revere's ride, and it's shown on the back side of this coin. This was one of the few events of truly national significance to be commemorated on a coin in the 1920s up to this date. This is the 1925 Lexington Concord Sesquicentennial. The 1925 Stone Mountain Memorial. This coin's main purpose was to raise money on behalf of the Stone Mountain Confederate Monument Association for the Stone Mountain Memorial near Atlanta, Georgia. Stone Mountain is a must-see if you've never seen it. The work on the granite carving was begun in 1917, and this was to be a monument to recognize the valor of the soldiers of the South. The problem with this coin was that many northern congressmen opposed spending the federal funds for coinage of anything commemorating leaders in the Southern Rebellion. Finally, the text authorizing the coinage was altered, adding the verbiage, and I quote, and in memory of Warren G. Harding, President of the United States of America, in whose administration the work was begun, end of quote. 
In this form, the coin was finally able to be, um, to be, to be minted and approved. Hardick's death in office was probably the only reason this coin managed to become law and recognize the soldiers of the South, but no mention of hoarding appears on the coin. This is probably the most controversial coin in my 50 coin set. Well, maybe one other one that you've not seen yet showing the rebel flag. If this stone mountain coin had been proposed as a Confederate memorial half dollar, which is really what it was, undoubtedly the bill would not have been passed. And many American citizens, particularly those living in the North, felt that the Carl Stone Mountain Memorial was inappropriate for there was no reason to honor the lost cause of the Confederacy. The coin features the depiction of Confederate Generals Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson on the front side. The 13 stars around them and above them allude to the 13 seceding southern states. On the back side, the inscription, Memorial to the Valor of the Soldier of the South, alludes only to Confederate troops. Scattered in the background are 35 stars. The number was originally supposed to be 34. This would be representative of the number of Union states immediately before secession. This is the 1925 Stone Mountain Memorial. The 1926 Sesquicentennial of American Independence. The front side of this half dollar features portraits of the first president, George Washington, and the president in 1926, Calvin Coolidge, making it the only American coin to depict a president in his lifetime. This coin was to commemorate the 150th anniversary of American Independence. The Liberty Bell appears on the back side, making the sesquicentennial half dollar the first U.S. coin to bear private advertising. That is the legend, passing the stove, which is in this area right in here. Very faint. Hard to read on my coin. The passing stove is inscribed on the bell, for the long-time defunct partnership of John Pass and John Stowe, who recast the bell after it initially broke in 1752. Good advertisement. Fixing the bell. The bell is also inscribed, and again hard to sell my coin, with the biblical verse, Leviticus 25.10. Again, right in here. Leviticus 25.10 says, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. End of quote. This verse refers to the year of Jubilee discussed in Leviticus 25, which gave the instructions to the Israelites to return property and free all slaves every 50 years. But the bell, despite its inscription, did not proclaim liberty to all the inhabitants of the land, for slavery was allowed to persist. Now, let's look at three things. The Liberty Bell inscription on my coin, Leviticus 25, and that our founding fathers believed that the year they ordered the bell, which was 1751, was actually a jubilee year. I believe for some, all this might be worthy of more study, and this ties right into Jonathan Kahn's books on the jubilee. This is the 1926 sesquicentennial of American independence. The 1927 Vermont sesquicentennial. This commemorative coin was to mark the 150th anniversary of Vermont declaring itself fully independent in 1777, and of the American victory at the Battle of Bennington that same year. The bust of Ira Allen, labeled Founder of Vermont, alludes to the man who took a dominant role in the provincial conventions of 1775 through 1777, leading to the Vermonters declaring the area an independent republic in 1778. Originally, Ira Allen's aim was not so much to get rid of the Brit British redcoats as to get rid of the land grabbers from New York. Ethan Allen and his younger brother Ira formed a group of insurgents known as the Green Mountain Boys. Vermont, in the French language, is the equivalent of, quote, Green Mountain, end of quote. Soon thereafter, the Revolutionary War erupted, and the Green Mountain Boys captured the local fort from the British. The backside features a Vermont catamount, a large cat related to the mountain lion, which is facing and walking to the left. The date, August the 16th, here, refers to the date of the Battle of Bennington. This is the 1927 Vermont sesquicentennial. The 1928 Hawaiian sesquicentennial. The Hawaiian sesquicentennial half dollar was proposed because of the observances there for the 150th anniversary of Captain James Cook becoming the first European to reach the Hawaiian Islands, or as it was termed back then, his discovery. Planners decided on a date for the celebrations as August 1928. The bust and naval uniform represents Captain Cook, discoverer of the Sandwich Islands, named in honor of the Earl of Sandwich, who was a financial supporter of Cook's voyage. These islands would later be known by their true name of Hawaii. 
The object after captain, this object right here, is a compass. Its needle pointing to the north, so that the captain is shown as facing westward towards the island which he discovered. The eight triangles in the lower field, there's four right here, there's four right here. They represent the eight largest islands in the Hawaiian group. On the back side, the landscape represents part of Waikiki Beach, with Diamond Head in the background. Instead of the present beachfront hotels, there are only occasional grass huts and coconut palm trees on the coin's back side. Standing on a rock, facing in the general direction of Pearl Harbor, is a native warrior chieftain, wearing a feather cloak and holding a barbed spear. To show that his intentions are peaceful, his hand is extended in welcome. Behind him is another coconut palm. Here's the coconut palm behind him right here. This is the 1928 Hawaiian sesquicentennial. The 1934 Maryland Tercentury. The Maryland Tercentury Commission sought a coin in honor of the 300th anniversary of the arrival of English settlers in Maryland. The bus labeled Cecil Calvert is that of the second Lord Baltimore, after whom the city is named. The reason Baltimore, 1609 and 1675, is betrayed is that he received the immense land grant, which was some 10 million acres, of what is now called Maryland from King George I, ruling it as a benevolent place, and according his subject's religious freedom at a time where it was not to be found anywhere in the English-speaking world except Rhode Island. On the back side, the two workers represent labor with a spade. The spade is right here. And the fishing industry with a fish. Here's the fish over here. As for the motto down here, fati, mashati, paro, feminine, or something like that, which means deeds are manly, words are womanly, belong to the state of Maryland, which did not show much disposition to repudiate that sexist rubbish. Then the Maryland General Assembly in 2017 passed an act disavowing that translation, saying it meant strong deeds, gentle words. The date, 1634, is that of the arrival of the 200-odd colonists at St. Mary's, the first group to settle in Maryland after Lord Baltimore obtained his grant. This is the 1934 Maryland Tercentury. century 1934 Oregon Trail This coin commemorates those who traveled the Oregon Trail and settled the Pacific coast of the United States in the mid-1800s. During this period, before the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 that made travel a lot easier, hundreds of thousands of people journeyed along the Oregon Trail to settle the far west of the United States. Not all who began the journey reached their destination, as there was much suffering and death along the way. This coin had several purposes. First, it was to honor the 20,000 dead, the Liberian unknown graves along the 2,000 miles of this great trail in American history. Second, it was to provide funds to rescue the various important points along the old trail from oblivion. And finally, to commemorate with suitable monuments, memorials or otherwise, the tragic events associated with that Im immigration. On the front side is an Indian, and no single tribe is represented. He stands with a blanket and bow without a peace pipe. His gesture seemingly warned the westward bound, westward bound whites as if to say, so far and no further. Behind him is a map of the United States with a line of Conestogo wagons heading west that can be seen starting at his right elbow. On the back side, the same type of wagon heading for the setting sun drawn by two oxen is led by a pioneer, his wife and a baby within. There is no stated reason for the five stars. Right. These five stars right here. Perhaps they represent states or territories crossed en route from St. Joseph, Missouri on the way west. This beautiful coin is one of my favorites. The 1934 Oregon Trail. The 1935 Connecticut Tercentury. We're halfway there as this is coin number 25. This coin was to help observe the 300th anniversary of the founding of Connecticut. On the front side is a very Art Deco design that represents a charter oak. It is pictured with a prominent cavity in the trunk, which is right here. This cavity is overemphasized for historical reasons rather than realism. 
realized we also have made these leaves up here in the tree about a tenth the size they were compared to the trunk. Use of this tree as a symbol of Connecticut was inevitable. In 1662, King Charles II granted the younger John Winthrop a royal charter for the colony. But when James II succeeded to the throne, he sought to recall all his predecessor's charters and to consolidate all of New England colonies under Governor Sir Edmund Andros. Andros visited the colony and wanted a meeting, and one evening he announced that he intended to seize the charter and return it to the king. All the candles were extinguished long enough for someone to hide the charter in the oak tree's historical cavity. Andros left because he was powerless if he did not have that document. The original charter was retrieved and a fragment of it remains with the Connecticut Historical Society today, and the tree has forever been known as a charter oak. That oak tree was about a thousand years old when some 21 feet around the base before lightning blasted it on August 21, 1856. After lightning failed it, its wood was used for making various historical items, including the chair today still reserved for the, Hart for the Hartford President of the State Senate. The Charter Oak Memorial stands today on the side of the tree at Charter Oak Avenue and Charter Oak Place. The Charter Oak then is a symbol of Connecticut's colonial independence. On the back side, you see 13 stars for the 13 original colonies that form a semicircle around the eagle, although they are so faint they might not be visible to everyone. This is the 1935 Connecticut Tercentury. century. The 1935 Hudson Half Dollar Relatively unknown to the outside world at large, Hudson, New York, a town of about 14,000 residents in the 1930s when this coin was minted, was to take on national importance on the coin collecting scene in 1935 when its 150th anniversary was celebrated. President Roosevelt approved congressional legislation that provided for several dollars to be coined for the city of Hudson. And this is what I call a funky coin on both sides. On the back side, buried in the waves below the ship is the word Hudson. Uh, right here is Hudson. Referring less to the city than to the explorer Henry Hudson. The town name and that of the Hudson River were taken from Henry Hudson, famous for his voyages of exploration in the New World during the 1600s. His ship, the Half Moon, rides at full sail while a crescent moon, right here, is up in the sky with a bump on the inside of the crescent for the nose of the man in the moon. On the other side is the city seal of Hudson, New York, with the device of King Neptune right in the middle, riding backwards on a spouting whale, whose eye is represented as being about where the blowhole should be. It's very odd for a town to use a whale as a symbol while the town is 80 miles as the crow flies from the ocean. Neptune is briefly clad in a wisp of cloth blowing in the wind. Behind the whale is a mermaid blowing a conch shell. Right here. Ete decas et premium recte. In the ribbon. Means both the honor and the reward of the righteous. It is the village's motto. All said, it is a pretty coin. The 1935 Hudson half dollar. The 1935 Old Spanish Trail. Let me explain this very simple design of a commemorative coin. Carbaz de Baca, right here on the back side, is Spanish for head of a cow. The Spanish explorer, full name is Alvar Nuez Carbaz de Baca. And since there's no known portraits of him, the cow's head dominates the back side. The proper last name is Nunez and Carbaz de Vaca was kind of a title. There were stories about why the explorer used it. One story is that Nunez's grandfather had used cow skulls as trail markers, after which the family adopted the practice. The front side features a yucca tree in full bloom, superimposed against a map of five Gulf states, with a line intended to describe de Vaca's route, running from Florida to El Paso, which is the only place named. There are dots along the route representing St. Augustine, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, Mobile, New Orleans, Galveston, San Antonio, and the end of El Paso. This is inaccurate as Duvaca traveled along the Gulf Coast for the most part by boat rather than overland. The old Spanish trail as shown on the coin followed a completely different route than the path taken by Duvaca, which was by boat in the Gulf of Mexico. The coin is misleading because it shows the trail is totally overland 
and mostly in straight lines, joining cities that did not even exist under generations after Nuez's expeditions. This corner was used as a fundraiser for the El Paso Museum, where it was believed to be the end of the trail, and to celebrate the 400th anniversary of a trail used by Nunez. The Spanish Trail Half Dollar may be the strongest contestant for the title of least attractive American coin ever minted, and that stretches back to 1793 to today. This is the 1935 Old Spanish Trail. The 1935 California Pacific Exposition. The California Pacific International Exposition was a World's Fair held in San Diego's Balboa Park in 1935 and 1936. One of the largest expositions of its kind, it was held on 1,400 acres of land and cost over $20 million. The coin was meant to help with the cost of the exposition. The front side of this beautiful coin shows elements of the California State Seal. Despite the word liberty right here, the seated female is meant to be Minerva, goddess of wisdom. She wears a helmet and holds a staff with her right hand. Her left side rests on a shield with Eureka. Right here is Eureka. Meaning, I have found it, which is the California state motto. But there's no olive branch for peace. Which is all the more odd, because Minerva was a Roman name for Athena, who taught the Greeks to grow olives. On the goatskin shield used for protection is the head of Medusa. Here's the head of Medusa right here. Between the goddess and her shield is a cornucopia, here, which is just overflowing with produce, symbolic of California's vast resources. A grizzly bear, which is the official state animal, is to the left of Minerva. Behind them, in the distance and hard to see, is a sailing ship right here. Here's the sailing ship. And also a miner wielding a pickaxe. And also the hills of the Sierra Madre Mountains, which are here, here, and here, are in the background. The backside shows two buildings constructed for the exposition and part of the California State Buildings at the fair. One of them is the California Tower, and the other is the Chapel of St. Francis. This is the 1935 California Pacific Exposition. The 1934 to 1938 Texas Centennial. The history of the state of Texas is rich and colorful. The year 1836 was especially important, as the siege of the Alamo in San Antonio took place in that year, followed by General Sam Houston's trapping of the hostile forces of Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21, 1836. A few months later, Texas became independent from Mexico. The front side of this coin depicts a large eagle perched on a branch superimposed on the Lone Star, which is in reference to Texas being the Lone Star State. Six stars flanking half dollar, three on each side. There's three right here and three over here. Probably allude to the six flags which at various times have flown over Texas. The flags themselves form part of the backside. No reason has ever been given why the hyphens are in the United States of America. Hyphens right here, here, and here. On the backside, the question is, where do you begin to make sense out of all this jumble? Miss Wing Victory holds an olive branch in her right hand, while her left hand rests on a miniature replica of the Alamo. Remember the Alamo at the bottom became a valor cry to General Sam Houston's troops. Above Miss Wing's Victory are the six flags which have flown over Texas. Flags are right here. Here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Those six flags that have flown over Texas, Spain, France, Mexico, the Republic, the United States, and the Confederacy. Their folds show, but there's not enough details on the devices to enable any one flag to be identified. Below the wings are two medallions. One here, one here. Representing General, General Sam Houston and also Stephen F. Austin, who was known as the father of Texas. The mint requires the word liberty to appear on all U.S. coins, and it's right here. And the word is placed on a scroll partially obscuring the flags. The modeling, spacing, and lettering are all clear and lively, while maintaining all the minute precision necessary to fit everything into the field. In my opinion, this coin has one of the greatest designs on its backside in the commemorative coin series. This is the 1934 to 1938 Texas Centennial. The 1936 Albany Charter. 
This coin was truly of local significance and was wanted by city officials to mark the 250th anniversary of the 1686 grant of its municipal charter by the governor of Colonial New York. Albany is the second oldest chartered city in the United States and the present-day capital of New York State. The front side of the half dollar depicts a beaver. Many of Albany's early settlers earned a living by trudging in beaver pelts, and the animal appears on the city seal. The coin was modeled from a live beaver while knowing on a branch of maple, the New York State tree. You can see two, two maple keys which contain the seeds. There's one maple key there, one maple key there. Along with the pine cones on the back, there's a pine cone there and there. They were meant to symbolize the growth and fertility of the community. The lumber industry was for many years a mainstay of Albany's economy. The back side depicts two young gentlemen from Albany taking leave of the governor while holding the city's charter. A small pine tree is visible behind the governor and an eagle overspreads the group with a small word of liberty above the bird. The coin's design has always been considered pleasing by coin collectors and every symbol on this issue has significance as connected with the early colonial history of New York. I want to point out another thing about this coin. This is a silver coin, but it is toning. It's just beautiful. This, this maple color leaf sounds like it's fall time. It's turning right here. The color between the three gentlemen, you see rose and you see oranges and you see magentas and you see all sorts of colors right here. Very subtle, subtle colors in here. I've spoken, this is a beautifully coined, uh, toned coin. Uh, this is the 1936 Albany Charter. The 1936 Boone Bicentennial. This coin was issued to commemorate the 200th birthday of frontiersman, trapper, and explorer Daniel Boone. It is to be used to raise money with approval of Boone's descendants to restore several historical sites pertaining to the famous frontiersman. On the front side of the coin is a portrait of Daniel Boone. Since no known portraits of him existed, this is an artist's conception. The likeness looks sadly different from the portrait of Boone, which had appeared in the previous 1921 Missouri Centennial Half Dollar. On the back side, Boone is represented with a Shawnee chief blackfish who adopted him as a son, allegedly discussing the treaty that was to put an end to the nine-day siege at Fort Boonesbury in Kentucky. Boone is holding a scroll representing the treaty, together with a musket. Boone's skirmishes with the Indians and his activities with Indians in the Revolution made him an American folk hero. This is the 1936 Boone Bicentennial. The 1936 Bridgeport Centennial. This coin was to honor the 100th anniversary of the incorporation of Bridgeport, Connecticut as a city. The front side depicts a showman, P.T. Barnum, who had less to do with, and I quote, the sucker born every minute, end of quote, than to all things he did to help Bridgeport to be, to be a better place to live. He was one of Bridgeport's most famous residents, was mayor of the city, helped develop it, and is buried there. It can be shown, among other things, that he laid out tree-lined streets in what eventually became Greater Bridgeport, reserved a grove of eight acres, which is now known as Washington Park, and is credited with stimulating the growth of industry in the Bridgeport area. But P.T. Barnum, the showman, had his greatest impact on the circus. Barnum Circus was known as the greatest show on earth. The Ringing Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus survived until 2017, after running for 146 years. On the back side is the most modernistic eagle ever put on a U.S. coin. Now the feather appears on its smooth surface and most say it resembles an airplane. This is the 1936 Bridgeport Centennial. The 1936 Cincinnati Music Center. This commemorative was, and I quote from the proposal before Congress in May 1936, I quote, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Cincinnati, Ohio as a center of music and to commemorate Cincinnati's contribution to the art of music in the United States for the past 50 years, end of quote. No one suggests that Cincinnati lacks musical interest or talent, but no one has ever been able to find any event occurring 50 years earlier in 1886 that was worthy of commemoration on a nationally distributed coin. The front side depicts Stephen Foster, the composer and songwriter, who died in 1864, whereas Cincinnati was not notable as a center of music until at least a decade later. Foster did live in Cincinnati, but only for a brief period of time while working as a bookkeeper for his brother and his main contribution to American music came later when he lived in Pittsburgh and in New York City. 
Foster made a valuable contribution to the folk literature of American music and very popular songs he wrote such as Swanee River and O Susanna. But this contribution was not made during his short stay as a bookkeeper in Cincinnati. The backside is supposed to represent the goddess of music, holding what is supposed to be a lyre, but apparently this lyre must have been bought at a five and dime and it looks to be just a toy. Even within Cincinnati, few people knew about these coins in 1936 and the 50th anniversary for which it was supposed to celebrate had no basis in historical fact. This is the 1936 Cincinnati Music Center. The 1936 Cleveland Great Lakes. Got to look close to the date on this coin, which is on the back side, right here, 1936. This coin was issued to mark the 100th anniversary of Cleveland, Ohio as an incorporated city and in commemoration of the Great Lakes Exposition held in Cleveland in 1936. Front side features Moses Cleveland, which is based on the only known portrait of him by an unknown artist. After the American Revolutionary War in 1795, Moses Cleveland was a surveyor and a lawyer. In 1796, by the shores of Lake Erie, he set out a town, town site that later became the Bears' name. In 1830, a newspaper was founded to be called the Cleveland Advertiser. The editor found the name one character too long to fit in the printed form and dropped the first A in Cleveland in Moses Cleveland's name. If you drop this first A right here, what you get is the word Cleveland, the name of the city. This change was adopted by the public and the town of Cleveland became a city in 1836. The back side shows a map of the Great Lakes region with nine stars to represent its principal cities, listed from west to east, Duluth, Milwaukee, Chicago, Toledo, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, Toronto, and Rochester. Cleveland gets the largest star, which is shown by the longest arm on the compass. It has been suspected that the compass was intended to show Cleveland as a center of industry. This is the 1936 Cleveland Great Lakes. 1936 Columbia Sesquicentennial. The front side of the Columbia Half Dollar depicts Lady Justice bearing a sword and a set of scales, though lacking the blindfold which is used in many depictions. This is a bit unusual because since the 16th century, Lady Justice has often been depicted wearing a blindfold. The blindfold represents impartiality, the idea that justice should, should be applied without regard to wealth, power, or other status. To her left and right are South Carolina's old and new state houses with one of the anniversary dates under each. The back side depicts a stylized palmetto tree, the emblem of South Carolina. Arrows are tied to its base in a St. Andrew's cross or X pattern by a broad ribbon, signifying the tree's military connotation. On June the 28th, 1776, a British naval squadron tried to seize Fort Moultrie, which was constructed of palmetto logs in Charleston Harbor. Though many shots were fired by the British ships, those that hit the fortifications were absorbed by the soft palmetto logs that formed it, and the American death toll was 12, against hundreds of British killed by the fort's gunfire after 12 hours of bombardment. The oak branch at the palmetto's base symbolizes the British vessels made of oak. It has been written that the South, Carolina had, South Carolinians had proved in 1776 that the palmetto was superior to the oak wood of England, and so the tree appears above the oak on this coin. The 13 stars surrounding the tree may symbolize the original 13 states, but may also have been intended to bring to mind the Confederate States of America. This commemorative coin is very attractive in its sim simplicity. The 1936 Columbia Sesquicentennial. The 1936 Delaware Tercentury. This beautifully toned coin on the front side was to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the first successful European settlement in Delaware. On this front side, the sun's rays are seen piercing the clouds, presumably symbolic of divine protection despite adversity. The rays shine on the old Swedish church, Holy Trinity, at Wilmington. This church was built in 1698 and remains open today as the oldest Protestant church building still in use for worship in the United States. Although they're barely visible, notice the vine on the coin here 
above the door in the bell tower. The backside features the Swedish ship, the Key of Kalmar, which sent the first settlers to Delaware. The three diamonds surrounding the dates on the backside is one, two, three. Those three diamonds allude to the state's three counties of Kent, Newcastle, and Sussex as well as to those counties' minuscule size and great fertility. Apparently, the field of diamond symbolism was taken seriously enough to give the state the title Diamond State, although no diamonds are actually ever mined in the state. This is the 1936 Delaware Tercentury. The 1936 Elgin, Illinois Centennial. Elgin, Illinois is located on the Fox River about 30 miles west of Chicago. The community was founded in 1835. It became a village in 1847 and a city in 1854. In that latter year, a watch company, the Elgin Watch Company, was founded there and the city became well known for the firm's timepieces. The front side of the Elgin Centennial Half Dollar depicts a pioneer as shown by the legend above him, right above his head, going from here all the way around to here. This bearded pioneer appears slightly modified as the head of the rifleman on the left of the group on the back side. The year 1673 on the front side marks the year explorers entered into what is now Illinois. The back side depicts a group of pioneers, four adults and a baby in its mother's arms, who might have settled in the area around 1835. A child is the second baby to be implied, but not fully seen on a U.S. coin. The other one was shown with a mother inside of the Conestago wagon on the Oregon Trail Memorial Half Dollar. This is the 1936 Elgin, Illinois Centennial. The 1936 Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg was generally considered to be the turning point in the Civil War and our nation's history. To commemorate the battle's 75th anniversary and to help fund a blue and gray reunion for surviving veterans, Congress authorized a Gettysburg silver half dollar coin in 1936. While the 75th anniversary was a relatively small event compared to the 50th anniversary, which was held in Gettysburg, and saw more than 50,000 people attending. The 75th anniversary, amazingly, still had Civil War veterans from around the country attending. Besides approximately two dozen men who had actually fought in Gettysburg, there were a total of approximately 1,800 veterans attending the reunion. On the front side of this coin, you see a Confederate and a Union soldier. The designer of this coin used different models, but he somehow made them look alike, seemingly brothers, with remarkably similar facial expressions. He communicated this as a reminder that the Civil War did in fact pit father against son and brother against brother. The Union soldiers represented by the image on the left in the flannel cap. The back side showed two shields, one representing the Union and the other the Confederacy. They are separated by a bundle of rods containing an axe with a blade protruding. This is the only U.S. coin to bear the image of the rebel flag. In fact, there had been an exemption made by eBay to allow this coin to be sold on their website because of their ban on sales to pick the Confederate flag in the summer of 2020. This is the 1936 Gettysburg. The 1936 Long Island Tercentury. In the year 1636, the first white settlement was established in Long Island at Jamaica Bay, an event which memorialized 300 years later by the Tercentury Committee. On the front side, you see two busts, one representing a Dutch settler and the other an eloquent Indian. The heads are partially imposed on each other to infer the harmonious balance of a peaceful settlement. But one critic of the coin said, and I quote, The front side shows conjoined portraits of two rather tough-looking gentlemen, but so far I've been unable to ascertain just who they are or who they're supposed to represent. The back side is supposed to be a sailing vessel and was apparently modeled from one of the usual toy ship models. However, since it is a legal coin authorized by the United States Congress, we accept it for more or less as a member of the fast-growing family of commemorative halves. End of quote. This is the 1936 Long Island Tercentury. The 1936 Lynchburg Sesquicentennial. This coin was issued to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the 1786 incorporation of the independent city of Lynchburg, Virginia. The front side of the coin depicts former Secretary of the Treasury and U.S. Senator Carter Glass, a native of Lynchburg. This made the Lynchburg half dollar the third U.S. coin to depict a living person, and the first one to show one alone. The earlier two 
the Alabama Centennial, and also the U.S. Sesquicentennial, to pick bust of a living person, a governor or a president, with a deceased predecessor. Glass also became the first person to have his signature on U.S. currency during his term as Treasury Secretary and his portrait on a coin. Having headed the Treasury Department, he was aware of the custom that living people should not appear on U.S. coinage. However, its waiver in his case did not attract unfavorable criticism, for it was deemed well-deserved. The backside depicts a statue of the Goddess of Liberty, her arms outstretched in welcome. In the background is seen a portion of Monument Terrace, with the old Lynchburg Courthouse also depicted. Before the building is the city's Confederate monument. It is one of the most recognizable Confederate monuments in Lynchburg and stands at the top of Monument Terrace. The statue is meant to memorialize Confederate soldiers killed in battle. On a side note, Lynchburg, Virginia was a strategic site for the Confederacy during the Civil War. It was ideally placed along several railroad lines and turned into a materials distribution point, and more importantly, a site of hospitals for treating wounded Confederate soldiers and even some Federal soldiers. All Army field hospitals were atrocious at the time and had very low survival rates for soldiers. The Lynchburg Confederate Cemetery itself is a peaceful and quiet place for a visit. It is well laid out, and sadly, there are over 2,200 graves of soldiers from 14 states who died in the hospitals of Lynchburg during the war between the states. There were originally over 200 graves of Union soldiers who died in the Lynchburg hospitals during the Civil War, but the federal government moved almost all those remains to other Union cemeteries soon after the war. This is the 1936 Lynchburg Sesquicentennial. The 1936 Norfolk Bicentennial. This coin commemorates the 200th anniversary of Norfolk being designated as a royal borough and the 100th anniversary of it becoming a city. The front side depicts the city seal of Norfolk. A sailing ship is shown on stylized waves. Below is a plow with three sheaves of wheat and the Latin word Cricus, translated as may you prosper. Above the ship is Eta Terra Eta Mara Deventa Ta, or something like that, meaning both land and sea are your riches. The inscriptions trace the progress of Norfolk from borough to city. The cave of water right here, separating the outermost legend from the city seal, may allude to the ship's ropes, which would be appropriate for this naval town. The two scallop shells here and here. Continue on with this maritime theme. The backside shows Norfolk's royal mace, right here, which was presented to the borough of Norfolk in 1753 and cherished ever since as the city's greatest treasure. It is the only royal mace ever presented to an American city during colonial times. It was removed and hidden during the Revolution and the Civil War and remains most of the time in a bank vault seldom exhibited, flanking the date of the land grant, 1636, or sprigs with dogwood, here and here. The front side of this coin has been described as maybe the most cluttered commemorative design ever produced. This is the 1936 Norfolk Bicentennial. The 1936 Rhode Island Tercentury. This coin was intended to honor the 300th anniversary of Providence, Rhode Island, although it bears no mention of the city on the coin. Roger Williams, who is shown in the canoe, was a Puritan minister, theologian, and author who founded Providence Plantations, which became the colony of Rhode Island. He was a staunch advocate of religious freedom, separation of church and state, and fair dealings with Native Americans, and he was one of the first to want an end to slavery. Williams was expelled by the Puritan leaders from the Massachusetts Bay Colony for spreading, quote, new and dangerous ideas, end of quote. And he established the Providence Plantations in 1636 as a refuge offering what he called liberty of conscience. In 1638, he founded the first Baptist church in America. He studied the Native American languages and wrote the first book on their language. And he organized the first attempt to prohibit slavery in any of England's North American colonies. The front of the coin is based on the seal of Providence showing Williams kneeling in a canoe. 
his hand raised as a signal of friendship. The Indian who greets him has his hand extended, palm down, meant as a native sign for good. Behind the Indian is a stalk of corn, as a reference to the help and friendship which the Indians had shown to the Mayflower pilgrims in establishing Plymouth Colony. The Bible in William's hand, other hand, symbolizes the colonists' contribution to America. The sun is rising in the background, symbolic of Rhode Island being the first colony where religious liberty was guaranteed. Liberty is a theme, is a theme of the design and appears over their heads. The backside depicts the anchor of hope, taken from Rhode Island State Seal. The motto, Hope, symbolizes the authority of the state government, while E Pluribus Unum, below it, evokes that of the federal government. This is the 1936 Rhode Island Ter Century. The 1936 Robinson, Arkansas. These commemorative coins were authorized to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the admission of Arkansas into the Union and were issued during multiple years. This 1936 version is notable because it contains a person who was living at the time of the coin's mintage, which only happened three other times in his 50 coin series. So there are only four living individuals that were, so to speak, illegally depicted during their lifetimes on the face of a coin. The front side features the head of Senator Joseph T. Robinson. He was a well-known figure within Arkansas, having served in the House of Representatives, as governor, and finally within the Senate. The backside symbolism is extremely complicated. Behind the eagle is a diamond-shaped symbol derived from the state flag. On this diamond symbol are 13 stars, which do not refer to the 13 original colonies. This simply can be identified as the upper half of the complete array of the 25 stars in the state flag, because Arkansas was the 25th in order of admission. Now here's the Arkansas state flag. What you see here on this coin is the top half of the state flag with 13 stars represented here, one star here and three below. Within the diamond are four more stars. The three lower ones represent three flags which have flown over the Arkansas territory, Spain, France, and the United States. Above the three is the largest star of all, representing the state's participation in the Confederacy. The rising sun behind the Eagle State device has been taken locally to mean the rising south. That would suggest that the seven longest rays up here, here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These seven mean the seven original seceding states, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. While six shorter rays down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, they represent the six rebel states which joined later, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, Tennessee, Missouri, and Kentucky. Complex and beautiful, just like my Jane. The 1936 Robinson, Arkansas. The 1936 San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. The San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge was opened to the public in November 1936, furnishing the occasion for a commemorative half dollar in its distribution. The front side features a California grizzly bear, which is the state emblem. There was a lot of criticism of the grizzly bear design at the time of its release, though. It was stated that the bear used for, for a model was Monarch II, and although he appears well-nourished and sleek on the coin, he lived 26 years in a cage in Golden Gate Park as a public exhibit. Objectors argued that such a bear was no fit symbol for liberty, which is the word that appears at the bear's feet. Right here. Now the four stars, three here, one here, lack any significance. They're just there. The other side of the coin depicts the bridge, as seen from the San Francisco side. The ferry building is in the foreground with Yerma Buna Island here and Berkeley Hills on, of the East Bay in the distance. In the left field are two steamships, two sketches to identify as to their type, and they seem to be there only for the reason of balance on the coin. The design for this side is complicated as there are no completely flat areas. Take note of the uniform parallel waves and the, nearby, and the nearly uniform evergreen trees. The waves are just uniform and the trees are uniform over here on the island. And lastly, do not confuse this bridge with the better known Golden Gate Bridge which crosses the entrance of San Francisco Bay. 
This is the 1936 San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. The 1936 Wisconsin Territorial Centennial. As the name might suggest, this issue does not mark the 100th anniversary of statehood, which would occur six years later, but rather the start of the territorial government. On the front side, it features an arm holding a pickaxe and a pile of lead ore and soil, alluding to the lead mines in the southeastern region of the state that attracted numerous immigrants in the 1920s. This is an image adapted from the Wisconsin Territorial Seal. This commemorative coin is somewhat unusual in that it shows a day date, 4th day of July, Anno Domini, 1836. On the back side is an image of an American badger standing on a log. Behind the badger are three arrows said to represent the Black Hawk War of the 1830s in a very stylized olive branch that is hardly recognizable. It is supposed to represent the peace that made the area safe for the white settlers. The surrounding inscriptions read, United States of America, e pluribus unum, liberty, half dollar, and in God we trust. This is the 1936 Wisconsin Territorial Centennial. The 1936 York County Tercentury. The founding of the first county of Maine was commemorated by this 1936 York County Tercentury half dollar. This issue was released among the outpour amongst the outpouring of other commemorators issued during that year. There were 16 in total in, that, in one year in 1936. They were for occasions of both significant and relatively obscure. And this one falls into the latter category. Not many people will care about or will remember the founding of York County, Maine. This is probably the most obscure local pride celebration to be honored by a commemorative coin. The front side depicts a stockade representing Brown's Garrison, which was the original settlement in York County. There is shown a rising sun in the background and a horse with rider in the foreground. The back side illustrates the seal of York County, consisting of a cross within a shield and a pine tree at the upper left. This is the 1936 York County Tercentury. The 1937 Battle of Antietam. This commemorative half dollar was issued to mark the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Antietam. The date of September 17th, on the back side, 1862, right here, is remembered as the single bloodiest day of the American Civil War, as federal forces under the command of General George B. McClellan countered the advance of Confederate troops led by General Robert E. Lee. By the day's end, both sides had suffered losses of more than 3,600 dead. Nearly 20,000 were wounded, and another thousand or more from each side would subsequently die of their injuries. All this misery occurred near the little hamlet of Sharpsburg in south-central Maryland, adjacent to a slow-moving creek called Antietam. The front side of the coin features the profiles of General George McClellan and General Robert E. Lee. The three stars, right here, behind Lee, refer to his rank as general in the Confederate Army. On the other side of the coin, the two stars here, to the left of McClellan, represent his rank as Major General in the Union Army. The back side features the scene of the bridge over Antietam Creek, which was the focus of fighting toward the end of the fateful day in 1862. It was later called the Burnside Bridge, after Ambrose Burnside, whose stubborn determination to take it wasted so many lives. Unlike many of the other commemoratives, the Antietam Half Dollar commemorates an event that was of truly national significance. With the Stone Mountain and Gettysburg issues, this is one of the three commemorants in this series specifically related to the Civil War, the 1937 Battle of Antietam. The 1937 Arkansas Centennial. This is the second year of production for these coins that will help to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the admission of Arkansas into the Union. I showed you the 1936 version with Senator Robinson on the coin four coins back. On this 1937 version, the front side features two Art Deco heads. One looks vaguely like either a prize fighter or an Aztec chieftain. Although with a feathered headdress, it's evidently intended to be a Quapa Indian since this friendly tribe formed the greater part of the population of what became the territory of Arkansas. As the female head wears a Pyrogean cap, we can assume that this is intended for a 1936 version of Miss Liberty. On the back side of the coin, the design used for the 1936 Robinson Arkansas half dollar was maintained, which features a bald eagle standing on a sun with rays. This is exactly the same back side as the 1936 version, which was four coins back, and was complicated to explain then. 
If you're interested, go back to the 1936 Robinson Arkansas coin and see the backside explanation. This is the 1937 Arkansas Centennial. The 1937 Roanoke. In remembrance of the 350th anniversary of the Roanoke Island settlement, known in history as the Lost Colony, the Roanoke Colony Memorial Association was formed. It successfully petitioned Congress for a commemorative coin marking the event. The front side features a profile portrait of Sir Walter Raleigh, who had been granted the charter for colonization by Queen Elizabeth I. This coin celebrated the fort named for him, Old Fort Raleigh, on Roanoke Island, and the birth of Virginia Dare, granddaughter of John White and the first English child born on American soil. Its backside is dominated by a standing figure of Eleanor Dare holding the infant Virginia. In addition to the commemorative and statutory inscriptions are a pair of sailing ships similar to those that might have been used by the colonists crossing the ocean and a pine sapling. Pine sapling is right here. This is the 1937 Roanoke. The 1938 New Rochelle. This half dollar commemorates the 250th anniversary of the settlement of New Rochelle, New York, a prosperous suburb of New York City. It is said to only be four to five minutes away from Broadway, which was the name of a popular song. The elegantly dressed gentleman and the rope fat cap portrayed on the front side of this coin relate to the form of payment made for this land when first settled by French Huguenots in 1688. John Pell, Lord of Pella Manor, sold 6,000 acres to Jacob Leisler, who was acting as an agent for the colonists. Among the terms of the sale was the provision that Leisler and his heirs would furnish John Pell and his heirs as an acknowledgment of another deed restriction under which Pell sold his land, one fat calf would be tended on June 24th every year forever, if demanded. John Pell is seen on the front side holding a processing calf being delivered in payment of the debt. The back side of this coin type is dominated by a Florida lease, an element found in the city's coat of arms and borrowed from the arms of La Rochelle, France. This Florida lease symbol has been the symbol of France since 1180. This is the 1938 New Rochelle. The 1946 Iowa Centennial. In my opinion, this is one of my top coins. On December 28, 1846, Iowa was admitted to the Union. The original capital was Burlington, then Iowa City, and later Des Moines was chosen as a better capital in 1857. The back side depicts a structure with this one-line inscription below. Right here is a one-line inscription. The old stone capital, Iowa City. This building is accurate even to the ivy-colored walls and lamppost in front of the steps. Here's the ivy-colored wall right here, and here's the lamppost. A lot of detail in this coin. The front side shows an eagle holding a large looped ribbon, which is adapted from the upper part of the Iowa State Arms. The Iowa motto on the ribbon is somewhat hard to read, but it says, and I'm reading from this ribbon right here, it says, Our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. A tight cluster of 29 stars, right up here, above the eagle refer to Iowa as the 29th state. This is the 1946 Iowa Centennial. The 1949 Booker T. Washington. These coins were sold through the Booker T. Washington Birthplace Memorial Commission to honor one of America's best known black educators. The commission was anxious that every African American boy to have one of these commemorative coins in his possession as an inspiration to emulate the ideals and teachings of Booker T. Washington. He became the first leader of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama a position he would hold for the rest of his life. His life was dedicated to the fight against racial segregation in the American South. Washington grew to become a leading figure in the movement and in 1901 would become the first African American to be invited to the White House to dine with the President, Theodore Roosevelt. Washington traveled extensively for the cause while still holding his position in Tuskegee, publishing books and papers, and giving inspira inspirational speeches around the country. These half dollars were minted in large numbers and offered by the Booker T. Washington Birthplace Memorial Commission at one dollar, with the proceeds going to perpetuate the ideals and teachings of Booker T. Washington and to raise money for memorials dedicated to him. The 
front side design features the portrait of Washington. The back side shows two buildings at the center, with the Hall of Fame of for Great Americans located in the Bronx, New York at the top, and the slave cabin where Washington was born near the bottom. This is the 1949 Booker T. Washington. The 1954 Washington Carver. All good things must come to an end, and this is coin number 50. One of the reasons behind this Washington Carver half dollar may have possibly been to oppose the spread of communism among African Americans. One of the early designs of the coin featured the American Legion seal with inscription, and I quote, United against the spread of communism, end of quote. This was later changed, and you can see it on the back, Americanism, freedom and opportunity for all. Now, there was very little ver objection to this verbiage on the back side. For few question that blacks as well as others should be kept from the communist influence. Those were the days where many citizens felt that communist agents were lurking on every street corner. On the front side, two subjects were honored on this coin. Dr. George Washington Carver and Broker T. Washington who had his own coin eight years earlier. Now, Dr. Carver joined the Tuskegee Institute and set up an agricultural research facility there, and he developed hundreds of products from the peanut. And peanuts were merely one of dozens of agricultural products he found alternative uses for in an effort to help diversify the southern economy and improve the lives of millions of poor Americans in the region. This is the 1954 Washington Carver. Wow, this is the end of my 50 coin series. I know that you've seen some coins that you've never seen before and probably learned a little American history. I truly hope you enjoyed the show. It ran a little bit long, but I hope it was worth it. And the time it took me to film and edit this production, I've grown a beard and put on a short sleeve shirt. Time flies as you get older. I have found that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. Now back to my coins. Based on the condition of the coin and its rarity, my complete collection that you've just seen is ranked number 15 in the world. No more commemorative coins would be issued by the United States until 1982, long after the 1954 Washington Carver you just saw. But I want to show you just one more coin. This is one of the modern commemoratives that were minted after the series that I've just shown you. This was minted in 1995. And the verbiage on this modern commemorative sums up the belief that I have in preserving this commemorative series of coins you've just seen. And I read on the back side of this coin. Enriching our future by preserving the past. Amen. Without getting into politics, it's way too obvious to me that the true history of the United States means very little to younger folks and many older ones also. Hope you enjoy the coin show. And now my model trains.
The video you've just seen I consider to be a small part of my legacy. It's now time to enjoy a glass of red Italian Chianti. I said my name at the first, but really my name is on this shirt. We need to get this room organized and we need to get the yard work done. We did all the research, writing, filming, and editing on this production. I hope that I've made it interesting enough for you to look at it again. See you next time around. Salute. Cheers. That's a wrap. Somebody get the light and shut the door. I forgot the lights. <laughs>